Hello friends, Johan here, back with a, another edition of what I've come to call Unscripted. Um, it's a Friday late afternoon or early evening here in Denmark. It's a pretty rainy, uh, black, bleak uh, Friday afternoon here in Denmark. Um, but uh, it doesn't matter because it's a good day here in Johanland. Um, today is the day that I get to do something that I've been wanting to do for, well, at least the last five years, possibly even 10 years. Uh, Today is the day that I get to do something that a lot of you have been anxious for me to do since I started uh, started aerating the idea on uh, on Facebook and various other places. Um, today is the day that I get to taste this very nondescript looking bottle of beer standing here next to me. Um, and so this is the time and place where some of you are going to go, huh? And others of you, even with the darkness in the room around me, are like me are starting to go, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> uh, because what I have here next to me is uh, what some have called the holy grail of beer, what others have called the great white whale of beer, um, some have called it the bucket list beer of choice. Um, many names for this thing here. Um, what I have here is what many consider to be the best beer in the world. Um, it's certainly what almost everybody considers to be the most sought after beer in the world. Um, one of the most famous beers in the world. Uh, this here is the uh, legendary uh, Westfletern 12 from uh, the uh, Monk Brother Brewery of St. Sixtus in Westfletern, uh, Belgium. It is... Um, one of three beers brewed there, and it is certainly the most famous beer brewed there. Um, why such a big fuzz over such a seemingly unimportant looking beer? Um, well, the thing is that this is a beer not only brewed by the men of the cloth. Um, it's a beer brewed by monks um, belonging to, a, to an order called the Trappist Monks. Um, which is a very, very reclusive, uh, very old-fashioned monk order uh, who have many very strict doctrines, um, one of which being that most of their life should be spent in seclusion uh, with meditation and praying and getting closer to God. Um, another strict doctrine is that they should, whenever possible, they should try to produce crafts of foodstuffs that uh, to, in order to sustain their uh, their way of living and uh, what is meant by this is that they should actually only produce so much that they're able to maintain a uh, well a bare necessity life and to pay for the upkeep of the monastery in which they live um, and so at the time of this recording there are six uh, so-called Trappist breweries uh, Trappist monasteries in Belgium uh, brewing beer um, Vesplatern is one of them. Um, a few others would be uh, some big name places like Orval, uh, Chimay, or Vestmala. Um, and these Trappist breweries, they definitely have very um, different opinions of uh, what, in, what a basic upkeep of a monastery and a basic way of living would be. Uh, the giants such as Chimay and Vestmala, they are pushing out beers in an unfathomable amount, like, I don't know, like in the order of 200,000 hectoliters uh, per year. Whereas um, the guys in Vestplater and they have a very, they adhere to a very old fashioned, very strict rules about what uh, should be done. They produce, um, they produce beer in the order of, uh, I believe, six, uh, 60,000 cases per year. Uh, that would be split between three brews, uh, with the one here beside me being the absolute most um, rare of these and, and the most sought after of these. Um, so where others have been making big names, they've been uh, sticking to the old dogmas here. Um, basically uh, brewing only what is necessary to pay for their way of life and for keeping their monastery alive. Um, they're actually um, trying to limit uh, the availability of this beer in any way that they can. There are two places in this world, uh, in this world where you can legally buy this beer. Uh, one would be at the monastery and another would be at a cafe just on the other side of the road from the monastery. Um, so it's, it's, it's not something you see every day, most definitely not. Um, 
I've seen one brew from this particular brewery before, but this is my first time with the uh, Iconic 12. Um, and so why has it gotten so big? Well, a little thing called uh, beer journalism happened and then another slightly bigger thing called uh, the internet happened. Um, people started writing about this beer, uh, giving it reviews, like really uh, influential people in the beer world started talking about this. Um, it went uh, pretty immediately to uh, the number one spot on uh, ratebeer.com, which is the community uh, review website for beers. And ever since, it's just been incredibly, incredibly sought after. Um, the monks who brewed this stuff have responded to this um, demand in a pretty old fashioned way in that they've actually tried to limit um, the spread of this beer so that it might so that it may be enjoyed uh, by as many people as possible and not be turned into like a black market item. Um, you can actually, if, if you want to get a hold of this beer legally anyway, uh, you have to uh, actually phone the monastery at a specific time and put in an order for, I believe you, get, you can get as much as one case if you want to. Uh, you will then be assigned, assigned a time slot in which you can drive up to, uh, to the monastery. You will be given your beer, you will pay them, and you will receive, uh, receive a receipt saying that these are not... Uh, these are not for resale under the scrutiny of uh, any applicable law and of the Lord Almighty himself. So uh, I'm not gonna tell you where I got this, obviously. <laughs> um, but anyway, that is that is the gist of it. That is the leading into it. That is uh, a bit of info about the supposed best uh, beer in the world. Um, <laughs> let's have a close look at it, shall we? Um, I'm a little giddy as you might be able to tell, but you know, uh, I don't get to do this every day. Um, this is a uh, Belgian, obviously like a uh, Abbey style beer, it's a so-called quadruple, uh, which will be the strongest uh, type of beer available um, at any given monastery. Uh, Nondescript bottle, as you can see, there's the riding Trappist beer around the neck here. Um, all the Legally required information, as I, I hope you can see this, is printed on the uh, bottle uh, cap itself. Um, and this apparently is the old-fashioned way of doing it, because Trappist beers obviously weren't supposed to be a branded item. They were supposed to be uh, enjoyed by the monks of the monastery, and they're supposed to be sold along to pay for the upkeep of the monastery. So no branding needed, uh, obviously, in this case. But... Um, Let's pop it open and see what happens here. Oh, lovely. There's quite a bit of carbonation going on here, actually more than I thought there would be. Um, jet bag beer playing right now. No. This is uh, what is called a bottle conditioned beer, meaning that it is a bottle stale along with a bit of live yeast and uh, some either some sugar or some caramel uh, or other food for the yeast. Um, and that this then, well, the uh, yeast actually will obviously start to work away the sugar and that will then create the carbonation in the beer um, and the various uh, extra flavors that will be in there. Um, bottle conditioned beers are known to be able to, uh, well, you can keep them around pretty much forever in, this, in your cellar if they want, and they are, if you want, and they are known to uh, gain in intensity and flavor over the years. Uh, this particular brew um, should be very, very good for cellaring, uh, keeping around for, very, uh, for a number of years. It should only grow better with time, but uh, it's a bit too late now, isn't it? There's some pretty amazing aromas coming out of this uh, as we speak. You get some, there's definitely some malt in here. I don't get any hops at all. I'd be surprised if there uh, were any hops in here in this particular style of beer, uh, but I'm, I'm not detecting it anyway. There, there's some malt. Um, there's, I get sugar, like brown sugar. There's caramel. Um, really wonderful deep or almost earthy yeasty bready thing going on as well um 
One thing I don't think I, I mentioned at the beginning is that this is uh, quite a potent cocktail, um, clogging in at 10.2% alcohol by volume. Um, so, obviously not a beer for kids, uh, or pregnant women, those kind of things. Um, but let's give it a taste and see how this goes. And there's a lot of head going on here still, but let's try it. Wow. <laughs> um, I'm trying not to take the Lord's name in vain here, but um, this is, quite honestly, this is phenomenal. Um, if I'm to describe this, um, I would say, well, you know that song called Stairway to Heaven by that uh, old band called That Sublin that no one ever listens to anymore? Um, which is like the perfect song that just keeps building and then around, right around the uh, four minute and 17 seconds mark or so, the drums kick in. Um, that's what this beer tastes like right now. It's, the, it's everything just coming together um, and a load of, a load of complexity um, and sheer beauty. Uh, there's, there are immediate tones of caramel and brown sugar in here as well. There are, um, I get some raisins, plums, uh, deep, dark, dried fruit. There's yeastiness. There's uh, absolutely no alcohol whatsoever, uh, which makes this whole deal pretty dangerous. Um, you get you get sort of a dryness in the back of the note, which uh, to some would be a hint that there's uh, quite a lot of alcohol in here. Um, but it's not it's not stingy it's not burning it's not anything it's just, it's it's a sweet beer as well so uh it's really well integrated um or some sugar notes there wow oh, this this is amazing um you can't really describe all of this in one go um but uh, as always i'll do some more notes and there'll be more notes on the block uh, within some time um is this the best beer in the world uh well it's definitely a very good uh, well it's, it's definitely a phenomenal beer uh in its category is it the best in the world or the best in its category uh well it's hard to tell i mean without comparison uh which is why we have this guy with us this evening as well um this is another Trappist beer uh, from a slightly lighter, brew, uh, larger brewery called uh, Trappist Rochefort, uh, pardon my French, <laughs> or Flemish, whatever it is. Um, it is also hailed by some as being one of the best beers in the world, uh, and certainly a worthy contender to, um, to this other guy here. Um, I thought what we'd do really quick was just pour a little taste for comparison. Um, very similar, very um, dark beers, both of them. Um, what you probably can't tell on the camera is that this is uh, the Rochefort here on the uh, right, uh, your left fully, <laughs> is um, there's much more carbonation and there's much more aggressive carbonation. Uh, this is like a foamy thing and this is just aggressive bubbles coming up. Um, Few words about this beer. Uh, same style as our other one over here. Uh, it's a Belgian quadruple as well. Um, this is uh, clogging in at an unfathomable 11.3% alcohol by volume. Uh, so definitely a stronger beer. Um, I got a bit more alcohol coming through on the nose, actually, uh, but not in an unpleasant way at all. Um, oh, there's so much carbonation going on in this. It, uh, uh, 
is my first impression. Um, and that's going to sound terrible because this is really, honestly, this is not a bad beer at all. It's um, many of the same notes. I get more of a fruity note on this one, uh, more uh, like raisiny dried fruit on this one than I, than I do on this one. Um, I get a lot more carbonation. I get less sweetness, um, which might be a good thing, might be a bad thing, depending on the way you look at it. Um, there's I don't like the carbonation on this at all. Um, I think this needs to be sitting for a little while. Um, but again, it doesn't, it doesn't cover the fact that this is a phenomenal beer as well. Um, you get many of the same notes. You get you don't get near the same complexity as you do over here. Um, this is opening up actually a little. Uh, you get more yeasty bready notes coming through now. Um, Yeah, there's so many more layers in uh, the the uh, Vespadern. Um, it's just it, wow. Um, utterly complex, utterly charming, fruity, uh, dark malts, dark caramel, dark sugar, brown sugar, um, all mixed up. Um, and absolutely integrated. That that is the point here. Um, the Vespadern is absolutely integrated. It's Beautiful, beautiful product. Um, the Lush Fort is not bad, not bad at all. Um, it's a little more rough around the edges, is how I'd say it. Um, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I should probably mention that I don't, I don't encourage any of you to do this um, <laughs> experiment that I just did. Uh, uh, basically, what we got here is the equivalent of well. Two, two thirds of a bottle of wine going into these glasses right now. So if you're gonna do this, be very, very careful. Don't, well, sip it, don't drink it in the way that I just did. Uh, because seriously, this, either of these are so easily drinkable that they will mess you up and have you on the floor in, <laughs> in no time. Um, I'm gonna have some fun with these over the course of the evening, uh, catching up on some blocking and some things I need to do. Um, having some food, having a good time, enjoying myself. Um, drink these very, very responsibly because the most dangerous part about these is that the alcohol and either of them are so integrated that they will they will knock you over. Um, which is better? Uh, <laughs> obviously, uh, for my money, uh, the, the best pattern is, uh, is the winning contender here. Um, I have, um, my buddy Tom actually said it pretty well that uh, the best blade is probably a better beer, uh, but he would rather uh, share two of these with a good friend than he would share one of these with a good friend. Uh, Tom, I agree, and I respectfully, I respectfully disagree as well. Um, I agree that for most friends, I would definitely have two of these uh, Rachel Forts. Um, I would. Um, because obviously you could get two or three of these for the price of one of these. Um, for the really good friends, uh, like those who've been with you for pretty much forever, um, those who might not be able to drink at the moment because of some really happy circumstances. Um, Tina, yeah, but love you guys and congratulations. Um, for those, I would probably rather have one of these um, and then a little less of it, obviously, because uh, alcohol comes in and everything as well. Is Best Beer in 12 the best beer in the world? Eh, that is hard to say because there are so many different styles of beer. Is Best Beer in 12 the best uh, Trappist beer in the world? For my money, yeah. <laughs> Hands down, hands down. This is this is the best Travis brew of any kind I've ever had, uh, hands down. Um, it's the best Belgian in beer in the world, uh, probably. <laughs> there, the thing is, there are so many different styles of beer going around right now, and there are so many different opinions and tastes and everything. And the whole best beer in the world concept, it, it, 
this didn't make sense anymore in my book. This is, uh, as far as I can remember back, probably one of the most enjoyable beer experiences of my life, uh, just drinking this on my own like this. Um, will it be the best beer I've ever had? No. Um, I could go on forever about that, and I probably will philosophize a bit about it uh, uh, in the time to come. But if I'm to rate this uh, on a 1 to 10 scale, um, yeah, you know what? This is, I know there are a lot of reviews before me who've gone uh, 9 out of 10, 8 out of 10, uh, some even 6 out of 10, uh, out of personal, personal preference, I guess. Uh, in my book, this is, um, as it stands now at this point in time in my life, this is a 10 out of 10 beer. Uh, so, <laughs> God bless the monks at St. Sixtus. And yeah, guys, that is about it. Listen, thank you again so much for watching. Thank you so much for uh, liking, for commenting, for subscribing to what I do. Uh, it really means the world. If you like this stuff, you can, you know, obviously subscribe on YouTube, give us a like on Facebook, uh, go to my website, there'll be links for everything uh, in the description. Um, if you've had either of these beers, if you have an opinion on the matter, sorry about the moment going on, <laughs> going back outside. Uh, if you have an opinion on these, um, let me know in the comments. If you have another favorite beer, let me know in the comments. If you have a beer I should try, let me know in the comments. Or better yet, send me the beer. Um, <laughs> no, just kidding. You really don't have to send me, but yeah, yeah do. Um, thanks again, guys. As always, this is Johan doing crazy stuff so you don't have to. Um, take care. Thanks for watching.